the theme for this month is freedom, and I want to tell you a little story. This is Edward Steichen, who's one of the most influential photographers in history, and he has a, you know, a great portfolio of his own, but according to him, the culminating moment of his career, the biggest thing that he ever did was an exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in 1955 in New York, and it was called The Family of Man, and so he curated um, photos from 273 photographers from around the world and you know, kind of gathered them all together in an exhibit that was intended to kind of showcase the universality of the human experience and to, to show the ways that we're all sort of tied together. It was a hugely influential exhibition, it's still one of the most influential photography exhibitions of all time. And you know, it being in 1955, I was never actually able to attend that, but I did happen to find the, the book for it at the library one time, I just stumbled across it you know, many, many, many years ago. And it was actually really influential to me. It kind of, you know, it, it showcased and, and gave a broader perspective of what the human experience is and showed the ways in which, you know, there really is a, a massive diversity of culture and, and you know, different, different kind of societies, but there's also a lot that we, we all have in common. So that was something that was sort of hugely influential for me, and it, it helped to reinforce the idea of, of society to me, and it, it really it helped me to understand the interconnectedness that we all have. So this is, this is Thomas Hobbes, a 16th century British philosopher. And if you're curious, he's the same Hobbes that uh, Hobbes from Calvin and Hobbes was named after. And he wrote a book called Leviathan, which was, it was essentially a, a, about politics and how politics works. And so this was in the 16th century, so it worked a little bit differently back then. But he sort of popularized the idea of what he called the social contract. And the social contract is this idea that you know, when we enter into a society, we're sort of making a mutual agreement that I'm, I'm going to compromise on some things in return for the benefits of being able to associate with other people and get the benefits that come with that. And it's, it, in a way, we're sort of giving up some freedoms, but we're doing it voluntarily, and we're doing it for a lot of benefit that we then receive. Because without that, without, you know, without us connecting together as societies and, and you know, having that, that interconnectedness and collaboration, you know, the, the natural state of man is no arts, no letters, no society, and which is worse of all, continual fear and danger of violent death, and the life of man solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. So that's what happens when we don't have society to kind of help us get all those benefits that we get from, from connecting together and sharing those things. Now that thought process was kind of continued, um, and in 1762, this is Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and he wrote a book called On the Social Contract that kind of further explored that particular idea. And in it, you know, one of the, one of the things he talked about was, you know, they were, they were struggling to sort of define freedom. You know, are we free in our natural state apart from anyone else when we have no connections, no affiliations, no dependencies and nothing? Is that freedom? Or are we free when we enter into a society and we make some of those compromises? and we get then the benefits that come with that, which a lot of times are additional freedoms that, that come, a freedom to be healthier, freedom to be safe, freedom to you know, accomplish bigger things that we can accomplish alone. And so they kind of went back and forth, but you know, he sort of fell on the side of, you know, when we enter into a society, we actually gain freedoms even though we're giving up some things. And, and, and that we're also very much free to enter into and leave those societies. Now that's kind of a controversial concept in an era when people were used to things like the divine right of kings and that kings were divinely appointed and they had absolute rule just because they were who they are. And he kind of positioned it, you know, much, much more our view of it's by the consent of the governed and that, you know, we voluntarily enter into a society and if we don't like it, we can leave that society and go somewhere else. And um, this was hugely influential in the, the French Revolution and this kind of thinking also in the American Revolution had a, had a big influence. And a lot of society comes down to the idea of compromise. And you know, when we tend to think of having to work with other people, we think of it as a struggle. You know, what if they don't want the same thing that I want? And what, you know, what if we have to do that? But when we learn the, the mechanisms of collaboration and the mechanisms of society, we're actually able to accomplish a lot more. And it, we don't have to chafe against it. We can actually sort of go with the grain and make it work really well for everyone involved. You're all familiar, I'm sure, with you know, the, the golden rule or the ethic of reciprocity. Um, you know, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. That's sort of the, the, the biblical version of it that we're culturally familiar with, but almost every culture in the world has some variation of that, that basic ethic. And that's, that's sort of the, the foundational element of what makes a society work. You know, it's, it's that idea of, 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to treat you okay and you treat me okay, right? And we'll, we, do we have a deal here? And, you know, if you think about it, if you're, you know, let's say you're a hermit off on your own, you know, trying to survive and there's someone else who happens to build his hut next to yours, that's probably the first thing you're going to agree on. I won't kill you if you don't kill me. And that's like the foundation of society. Everything is based on that, even though even that very first thing is a taking away of freedom. And, I mean, it could be seen that way, but really it then grants you other freedoms, like the freedom to survive and the freedom to, you know, do other things. Because, of course, without that, our lives are, you know, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And so we have to have those things to have the freedom to, to continue. And, you know, a lot of philosophers throughout history kind of came to those same conclusions. These are, you know, some of the guys that, that talked and wrote and thought about this idea of the social contract. And they all kind of came to that same conclusion, which is that through society, we gain sort of a, a fuller sense of freedom and we sort of are able to reach the human potential. And so, you know, by, by making those compromises, we gain freedom. And, you know, it's important to kind of think through that stuff because America, right? <laughs> if you, if, if there's, if there's one word that you know about America, it's probably freedom, because that's the thing we just keep saying over and over and over and over and over again. And it is, it is drilled into us from birth that we should be free, we should do whatever we want, we shouldn't have to listen to anyone. And sort of, we've sort of gotten this like weird, corrupted version of it. And we don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about what that word actually means. What does freedom actually mean? And so, you know, it, it means something very different to us than it does when, you know, the, the Declaration of Independence was first written. They were, they were declaring the freedom to associate and create a society and to, you know, collaborate in the ways that they wanted to without being oppressed or without being artificially forced to not do the, those things that they were trying to accomplish and to have that sense of society. But now, you know, if you, if you look up freedom on any stock photo site, including sponsor Shutterstock, um, you're going to see this, basically this photo over and over and over and over again. So, so, so let's, let's try this. Let's have some freedom. So put your hands up and look at the ceiling. Right? That feels, it feels good, right? Like you feel, you feel liberated. But the thing is, you know, the thing you notice about these people is they're all alone. Anytime you search for a photo of freedom, you're not going to find a group of people being free together. It's always a solitary person far away from everyone else, alone. And sort of in that natural state of, of no obligations, no dependencies, you don't have to answer to anyone, you don't have to do anything. And the reason for that is that society is hard. Like, it's hard to deal with other people. <laughs> and, you know, you, 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 know any, you take any two people in this room and try to do something together, and you're going to start doing this almost right away. Like, oh, why do you want to do that? I want to do this. Well, I thought we were going to, you know. And so we, ha we have that tension, and that tension makes society hard. And when things are hard, we have the natural reaction to want to just get away from it. And so that's what makes this feel so appealing, even though this is actually sort of distant from that, that broader sense of freedom, of freedom within a society and freedom to accomplish big things and do the things that we want. This is Gerrit Hofstede. He's a, a Dutch sociologist and anthropologist. And in the 70s, he worked for IBM. Um, and IBM, huge company at the time, offices all around the world. And part of his job was to figure out how to make these offices work better together, be, despite their massive cultural differences. So he started evaluating the different cultures based on, on a scale that he put together. One of the scales he looked at was individuality versus collectivism. So individuality is sort of a, an ego-driven, it's about me, it's about what I want to do, versus collectivism, which is, you know, it's for the greater good and I'll sacrifice myself to kind of help everyone. And what he found was that the United States is the most individualistic country in the world. And you guys probably kind of knew that, but quantitatively, we are the most egotistical country in the entire world. And it's important to know that so that we, you know, we know where we come from and we know what our, our society is all about. So this is, this is the kind of stuff that as Americans, especially young Americans, we value and admire and we like the people who just fight the system and do whatever they want. They don't care. They don't give a crap what anyone thinks. And we've, we've come to idolize that. And, you know, we've sort of created this, you know, a, a, a subculture of admiration for people who just completely break with that system. You know, they're not worried about the social norms. And, you know, we admire their bravery. And we say things like, oh, I wish I could be more like them and just do whatever I want. Well, you know, the interesting thing is there, there's another word for this. Sociopathy and psychopathy. And if you look, the, like the, the actual attributes, if you look up the definitions of sociopathy and psychopathy, it's essentially the same thing. It's people who don't care at all about that social contract that, that we have voluntarily entered into. 
And so they sort of abuse the system in a way. You know, they, they come into society, they take the benefits of society, but they don't do that giving back. They don't do the participation and that, that collaboration that makes it all work for us. And the fact that, you know, I might have to sacrifice my freedom to help you guys receive something. You know, I'm, as an example, I mean, I don't like public speaking. I'm really afraid of public speaking. This took a long time to prepare. I'd rather be at home playing video games. But it's actually, it's more important for me to be, to, you know, to have the opportunity to come and communicate with you guys. So I give up the freedom of just not caring and doing whatever I want and making sacrifices for the society to, to, it, you know, to, to help you and to kind of move things forward. And then that comes back and benefits me. And I get greater freedoms because of the contributions and, and all that stuff kind of works together. So this little bar is one of the, the main philosophies that I have in my life that helps me kind of sort things out and make decisions. So it, at one end of the bar, you have an extreme. And that could be anything, any, any extreme. And so what happens you know, if you're dealing with an extreme, either you're, you're there and you're passionate about it for some reason, you're all the way over at one end of the spectrum. And sometimes you know, if that doesn't work or there's something you dislike about it or you want to rebel against it, usually what you do is you go over to the other extreme. And the thing about extremes is they actually don't work very well at all. I mean, when you're in the, one of those extreme states, things are just sort of non-functional and you're missing huge numbers of opportunities. You're missing lots of ways that you can, can sacrifice and compromise and collaborate and do some of those things in between. So it's actually really not very healthy to be at those extreme ends. The right answer and the things that eventually makes us happiest and accomplishes the most in our lives is usually somewhere in the middle. Um, and, but the problem is, you know, moderation is not the sexiest thing in the world. It's not the most fun. It doesn't get our heart pounding. So you, you see this with politics, for example. I mean, you know, really, most people are somewhere kind of in the center of the spectrum, but it's way more fun over at this extreme and way more fun over at that extreme and to butt heads because that's just kind of our natural inclination is to be sort of tribalistic about it. Like, oh, you're this? Well, now nah, I'm going to be this. And you, you know, sort of fight it out. So no, even though the right answer is almost always somewhere in the middle, we actually have very little incentive to get there because it's way more fun and exciting and exhilarating to be over on the extremes. And interestingly, the Buddha actually talked about this a little bit. So, you know, during, during his kind of, you know, spiritual progression, you know, one of the things he, he tried to do was sort of overcome his physical constraints by what he called self-mortification and basically just starving himself and spending all his time meditating and just giving up all, you know, physical necessities to sort of transcend his, his physical being. And then eventually he was like, well, that doesn't work. Um, and so he, he, he stopped and he, he, this was actually a big crisis for his followers because his followers were like, well, you're giving up? Like we, got it, like we were doing this thing, remember? And he's like, whatever, this doesn't work and he kind of walked away from it. But he also knew the right answer wasn't to go to the other extreme, which is just a, you know, a hedonistic, sensualistic kind of lifestyle. That's a, that's a great picture, right? That was from a Hieronymus Bosch painting. Um, so he knew that wasn't the right answer. And so, you know, what he, he developed what he called the middle way or the middle path, which is, you know, the right answer is probably some sort of harmonious thing kind of down the middle. It's not this extreme or this extreme, it's somewhere in between. And, and that principle applies, you know, kind of throughout our lives. I mean, health-wise, this isn't right. But, you know, this isn't right either. Like, the, neither of those are particularly good for you. The right answer is sort of be a, like a normal human being somewhere in the middle. That's, that's our best state where we are, you know, the healthiest and can enjoy it the most. Um, but similarly, you know, we, as Americans, and when it comes to individuality and egotism and doing exactly what we want and not caring about other people, we are at the extreme. And it's important for us to know that, to know like what our baseline is. You know, we're, we're not in the middle and then we kind of vary from the middle. We are already at the far end of egotism and doing exactly what we want. And we have to know that to have that broader perspective of maybe it's okay to come back a little bit from that. You know, but at the other end, you've got, you know, maybe a country like China that's a highly collectivistic culture where you pretty much always sacrifice the individual for the greater whole. That's the other extreme. That's not very good either. And, and the problem is, you know, when we talk about going back and forth these, between these extremes, if you're at one extreme and you start to come back to the other one, it feels like you're just going to the other extreme and so your brain rejects it. But really you're not. You're just going to the middle where things are actually kind of healthy and stable and, and harmonious. Now, I don't know what's in the middle of there. There's no flag for that. But you know, that's, that's something that we have to figure out. Like, I mean, if we give up some of that individuality that we have and, and not, not go to the other extreme, but give a little bit and kind of be in a society and take advantage of that, what does that look like? And the truth is, we, we really don't know. Because in the United States, there is so much pop culture 
from birth driving us toward that, that complete individualistic state of just doing exactly what we want and not caring what anyone else thinks. Think, think about half the movies you watch growing up. You know, it, it, it's, there's, nev there's, never, there's never been a movie made about why it's good to listen to your parents. You know, it's, it's, it's always like, I'm, you know, I'm gonna, you know, my, my dad wants me to do this, but I'm just gonna follow my dreams and he'll see, I'll prove it to him. And then in the end, that always works out. In real life, sometimes you should have listened to your dad. You know, it's like sometimes he knew something that you didn't know. And, but we're not taught that at all. We are only taught, do whatever you want, follow your dreams, don't listen to anyone else and, and go do it. Sometimes that's good advice, sometimes it's not. And we need to have the balance of being in the middle so we can choose, and we can choose which one might be right in the, in the situation, instead of 100% of the time defaulting to, I'm just gonna do whatever I want. And so you know, this, this ideal, I totally get. I mean, there are times where that's all I want. I, just, I need to just get away and get to that. But we have to remember, that's like a, a snack. You know, that's, a, that's a vacation. That shouldn't be the lifestyle of choice because th that's ultimately what leads to isolation, being removed from the benefits of society and missing out on, on the opportunities that come with collaboration and association with other people. And so in my mind, you know, freedom really probably looks more like this, that family of man exhibit where we really are in an interconnected society, we really are dependent on each other with all the, the pain and hassle and annoyance that comes with that, but that's where our freedom comes from. And you know, the question is, what does that have to do with you? So why, why are we even talking about this? So I wanna talk a little bit about design. And so I'm, you know, I'm gonna talk about design in a very general sense. Um, design is creative problem solving. And so whether you self-identify as a designer or not, you might be a copywriter, you might be a videographer, you might be something else entirely, maybe you're a project manager. You're still coming in and helping people solve some sort of a problem. And so in my mind, you're a designer. So I'm referring to you when I talk about this stuff. So design, if you've heard me talk before, I talk a lot about how design is fundamentally related to empathy. And I would go so far as to say the word empathizer could be a substitute for designer in almost all contexts. And if, if what we're doing doesn't fit that, it may not actually be design. You know, if, if, if we're just putting pretty graphics together and delivering them and we're not really thinking about who has to use it, how they feel about it, what it does to their lives, what it encourages them to do or not do, we're, I don't think we're really designing. I think we're just throwing stuff together and shoveling it out there. Um, but I wanna give an example of how empathy ties into design. So this is, a, this is an amazing remote control. So this is the highest, highest ranked remote control in terms of ratings on Amazon.com. I went and looked it up. And I was, because I was expecting the highest rated remote control will be empathetically designed, and it is. So if you think about how you use a remote control, you don't, you don't hold it up in front of your face and, and do this to it. Usually you need to know where the button is. You're just pointing and your thumb should know what to do. And half the time you're doing it in the dark. So you need to feel your way around it and kind of, okay, there's the volume button. You know, on a poorly designed remote, half the time you hit the wrong button, you're turning the volume up when you wanted it down and everything's going, you're changing the channel in the middle of a movie. Um, but this one's very well designed. You, the, the buttons are shaped differently, positioned differently. There's kind of a symmetry to it. You can find your way around. Your thumb knows what to do. There's lots of different types of interfaces. This is an example of how empathy leads to good design. And, and there's almost a one-to-one -one parallel. I mean, if the design is empathetic and you thought through what the user is dealing with and address those issues, it will be good design. And if you look at anything that is good design, you can see clearly the ways in which it was designed empathetically. Not aesthetically, but empathetically. So I don't own that remote, but I do own one of these. <laughs> so we, we have this, we, we got a, a DVD player for the, our, our cabin up in Northern Arizona. And this is probably, it's probably the cheapest DVD player money can buy. Uh, the, the cyber home DVD player, and it came with this remote, which, you know, I was, I was gonna try, I couldn't, I couldn't remember the brand name, so I was just gonna find like a generic bad remote, and I spent 45 minutes looking and could not find one as bad as the actual one that we own that we have to deal with. So I, I finally figured it out and found the exact photo of this one. But if you look at this one, this one is not only impossible to use without looking, or impossible to use in the dark, you can't even look at when you're holding it up and trying to figure out how to change the channel. I mean, it, it is because everything is the same. There is no empathy at all in the design. It was designed exactly to some circuit board that an engineer put together and they just used a stock button panel right on top of it and put the buttons right over it and said, okay, well, let's assign the buttons to these functions and now we're done. There was no thought about what it's like to actually try to use the thing. 
So bad design is almost always directly connected to lack of empathy. The two are, are inseparably connected. If you find something that's not empathetically designed, it will be badly designed and vice versa. Now, beyond just designing things, you know, there's also empathy for the client. You know, we have empathy for the user, but we, need, we really need to have more empathy for the, the client and create the experience for them because you know, this is kind of how designers talk about our clients. You know, I mean, we, we're, we're, we're happy to their face and we smile and we take their requests and we go in and change them, but then when designers get together, this is how they talk. And to me, what that shows is a complete lack of empathy for the client who's coming to you, who's, who's got their fair share of stuff to deal with, and the, the logo that you want in one font versus another is just such a small part of their life and, and all the things that they're dealing with. And, and, and the truth is, they're not, they're not designers. They're not paid to be designers. Nobody trained them to be designers. They haven't spent all the time obsessing about it that we have. So they just don't know. And so we have to give them a little bit of slack for, for being in a situation that they, they don't understand. They're trying to figure it out as best they can. It's one of many things that they have. They don't have a whole lot of time to commit to it. They don't even know what questions to ask you. They don't know what kind of feedback to give you. We have to take that into account and just be, be a little bit cooler with our clients. because. You know, how, how would you feel if your doctor acted like a designer when it came to patients? <laughs> you know? You, you'll get your results when I'm ready. You know, it's like, you, we, that's, not, that's not how doctors are supposed to act. You know, be, be this doctor. Be the empathetic one. The one who's, who explains to you that you, you don't have lupus, no matter what you read on WebMD, <laughs> for the seventh time that day, she's explaining that to someone. And, and, but you know what? She's cool about it. She gets it. She knows people get confused. She knows they don't have the information that she has. So she's just cool about it and explains it. And, and I'm not talking about putting on a smiling face for your client and then, you know, bad mathing them behind their back. If you really have empathy for them and you get where that client's coming from, you're not, you're not feeling that anger. You know, you're not, you're not angry at them for making, wanting to make revisions because you get where that impulse is coming from. So you have to spend a little bit of time kind of putting yourself in their shoes. So let's talk about creative freedom for a minute. So we got we to make the pose again. Ah, freedom. Feels good. Feel the sunshine. So design isn't art. You know, art, art is about self-expression. You know, sometimes design and art get, get confused, and, and you know, very often designers are also artists. But design is not art. They're very different disciplines. Design is about making things happen. It's about accomplishing a particular goal. It's about persuading someone to do something or about creating a certain kind of experience that makes them feel better about it. Um, and so, but it's not art. It's not about us. It's not about us expressing ourselves. And if you go back to the doctor example, you know, the thing that a doctor knows that a lot of designers don't is that the doctor knows it's not about her. It's about the patient and the patient's disease, but it's not about the doctor. It's not about the doctor wanting to express herself. It's not about what disease the doctor wants to diagnose that day. It's, about, it's just about the patient and the disease. And that's kind of how we need to approach design. I mean, we have a client, the client has a problem. That's what we're solving. It's not about us expressing ourselves or us wanting to like, well, I really wanted to do the logo like this. Well, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter what we want that much. It matters how we solve the problem in the most effective way possible. And, and sometimes the client doesn't get it and it's a little, you know, we have to make some compromises and that's the social contract, right? We have this social contract with our client of two people are gonna come together and we're gonna try our best and it's gonna chafe a little bit, but we'll come up with a pretty good result. Now, there are, there are generally four reasons that kind of lead to us feeling like we don't have creative freedom. So I kind of want to walk through them. Um, the first one sounds harsher than it is, but it's, it's really that, you know, if we don't understand the craft that we do enough to consciously explain it, we're gonna have a really hard time explaining to people and getting them to understand where we're coming from. You know, because I'm the designer is not a valid reason for a certain design choice. You know, we have to explain why we chose that font. And to do that, we have to know why we chose that font. So there has to be a lot of kind of intentionality and, and conscious thought put into the design process. So the, the solution to that is just, you know, embrace your craft and, and seek to understand it. You know, you shouldn't design by the seat of your pants. You should actually have a pretty good understanding. If you think this is the right font, think through consciously, why is that the right font? And how do I explain that to someone? Because that's a really helpful thing to have. Um, you know, you're, uh, another problem is you're not getting into their head, and usually that is just the re result of empathy. You know, if you can if you can get where they're coming from, you can you can turn your explanation around in a way that resonates with them and that they value and they get get some benefit from. Another one, and th this is one that I do a lot, is you fall in love with the concept. So you you put something together. And then as soon as you see it, you're like, this is it. This is the one true concept. 
And then you show it to them and they want to revise it and you just feel completely betrayed. Like how do they not see this is the one true concept? You know, really there's, there's a whole lot of ways to design a solution to almost any problem. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of different ways to solve any problem. So for us to fall in love with any particular one that we came up with, that's more of our sort of resistance to change, our wanting to, you know, wanting the thing to be done and finding out that it's not done and feeling bad about that, more than it is the fact that that really was the one true answer. The truth is you could design something seven different ways and it'll probably still work really well and there are lots of different valid choices. So, you know, embrace the revision process. You know, trust that the first thing you do isn't gonna be the best one. It's a, it's, a, it's a prototype and you iterate the prototype and at some point you'll get to an answer that's really good that both you and the client are happy with. And you know, the truth is most things that go through a revision process, and we don't talk about this a lot, but most things that go through a really hearty revision process actually come out a lot better. And when you, when you look back at that initial concept, a lot of times it wasn't as great as you thought it was. And sometimes it goes a different direction than you wanted, but sometimes the original one was kind of weak and it's good to put it through the paces and make, it, make, it, make sure that it gets good. So revision's a beautiful thing, take advantage of it. And then the last one, and this is a really frustrating one, but you know, you have time and budget constraints. You know, you wanna do this, but the client has this budget and you have to find something that, that works within that. And, and to do that, I'm really it's about embracing the context that you're in. You know, when you're designing a solution, the, the timeline and the budget are part of the constraints that you're designing for. That's the box that you are designing in. You know, you have a frame and you're designing something in that frame. And that's fine, it's fine for those to be part of the constraints. So I wanna tell you another story. This is Ferdinand Porsche. And in 1931, he founded a company in Germany, an auto company called Porsche. Um, they, did, they didn't manufacture cars in the beginning, but they you know, essentially did consulting and development work for automobile manufacturers. And you know, around that time in Germany, Germany was going through a rough spot. I mean, you know, the, the Great Depression in the United States kind of affected everyone. Germany was having all kinds of problems of their own. You know, at the time they had about 30% unemployment. The economy was terrible. The average German family couldn't afford a motorcycle, let alone a car. Um, and so, in, you know, in 1933, in Germany, they have to elect a new chancellor. You might know him. And so, and so he had, part of, part of his wanting to resolve this problem was he basically demanded that someone come up with a car concept that could take two adults and three children at least about 60 miles an hour and it had to cost no more than a motorcycle. So those are, those are some, some constraints right there, right? That's, that's pretty tough constraints. So Ferdinand Porsche went at it. You know, there were a lot of companies kind of vying for this project and trying to compete and come up with solutions, but he, he just went for it and he said, I can, I can totally do this. And eventually, he developed a prototype, a functioning prototype that would take a family of five people at 60 miles an hour and cost no more than a motorcycle. And that's, that's, a, that's a pretty amazing design accomplishment. And the more amazing part is this, is, this is a picture of the last version of that car. It's basically, essentially the same car the entire time rolling off an assembly line. This is the last one in 2003 in Mexico. See the mariachi band in the back? I thought that was great. Um, it, you know, over that time, so this car in the same form was in production for 65 years. They made over 21 million of them. It is the most successful car in history. So, you know, we, we all have time and budget constraints, but keep in mind, Ferdinand Porsche was in the middle of essentially a depression with 30% unemployment, designing a car for a family of five that cost no more than a motorcycle, and his client was literally Adolf Hitler. <laughs> So you, you can probably work this out. <laughs> really, you know, design isn't about this. this. This isn't the context that we design in. It's not about us expressing ourselves and having complete creative freedom and we do what we want because we're the designer and we're right and they're just a stupid client. That's, that's not really design. I mean, honestly, this is design. You know, it happens within a context, it happens within society, it happens with collaboration, it happens with associations with other people who may not think exactly the way we want to, but somehow we make it work because we're a society and we, are, we have that social contract that we have entered into of, you know, I'm gonna help you and you're gonna help me and we're gonna make this work as best we can because we know that benefits everyone best in the long run. And as designers, you know, we need to know where we're coming from. We need to know we are Americans and we are, we are by default deeply egotistical and that sometimes we have to come back off that a little bit to make these relationships work and to function effectively in a society. And that's what I think about freedom. Thank you.